All right, welcome back to Ground Zero Salem. As always, I'm your host, Pat. Um, it's been a little bit over a week since that last video went up. It's done really well which for me, just saying. Uh, not Mr. Beast here, but yeah, a lot of eyeballs on it, a lot of engagement, which is great. Uh, thanks to everybody who had something to add to the conversation. I was uh, hip to a couple of bands I'd never heard of before, so that's cool. I That's half the reason I do this, is getting suggestions for stuff that I haven't heard. Um, but I figured the other piece of the conversation would be in concerning hardcore. The last video being about metal's influence into hardcore throughout the 90s and kind of as an addendum, kind of tacked on hastily sort of thing, talking about a handful of bands that I've been into that are kind of part of that chaotic, hardcore, screamo-ish kind of thing. I mean, it sort of dovetails with the, the metalcore. Um, I thought the uh, other part of the conversation that would be a cool thing to talk about and show off some of my collection would be bands that still were proudly waving the banner for more straightforward hardcore during that decade, specifically 1990 to 1999. Um, so I pulled a bunch of records, and to keep from going way too long, I didn't get too far into power violence, didn't get too far into crusty stuff, and um, trying to keep it to America. There's lots and lots and lots of great stuff going on overseas for hardcore all throughout that decade. Final Exit from Sweden, the entire Umea scene, um, Voorhees in the UK. There's everything ranging from, uh, of course, raging D-beat stuff to bands that were doing 80s-style American hardcore better than American hardcore bands were, all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to keep it to what I felt was underrated bands. There was a lot going on with hardcore in the 90s, um, so it's don't get upset that I'm not talking about Warzone or Ten Yard Fight or something like that, because all that's pretty well documented and well talked about. I especially wanted to talk about the handful of bands that were doing fast punk-inspired hardcore right in the dead center of the 90s when nobody was really doing it. I think I think Ten Yard Fight and Floor Punch were starting up around then, but there's a few picks I have in here that are like relatively obscure, and I just wanted to talk about these things that I discovered at the time. Um, yeah, covering a, a, a couple of different things. I also wanted to mention, I didn't pull them because I think they were plenty popular and, and well-regarded, but in my opinion, bands like The Pissed and House Rotten and Violent Society were definitely hardcore bands. I think a lot of people regarded them as like spiky hair type pogo punk kind of bands, or in House Rotten's case, maybe Crust or something. But, I mean, I think sonically these bands had just as much to do with Poison Idea and Negative Approach than they did anything from Britain. So, uh, just a shout out to those bands for keeping keeping straightforward hardcore alive in the 90s. Um, even though that's not what they were labeled. And The Piss put out a new record, and it's pretty good. So, I just wanted to start with a couple of LPs. A lot of these were bands that I would go see the first year or two that I was going to shows. So, they have a particular... Um, sort of sentimental importance to me, of course, but the first one at the top of my pile, and pretty much the first one always in my record shelf, because I put numbers at the beginning before the letters, is Four Walls Falling's Culture Shock. This was a band from Richmond, Virginia. Right here, I have uh, also the reissue here that Vinyl Conflict just put out. Black and white reissue. Um, Four Walls Falling were fast positive political hardcore pretty melodic vocals kind of shouted sung sort of vocals very much carrying on the spirit of youth of today and bands like that but making things a little bit more political um you know you got riot cops there on the cover but yeah incredibly well written music um things get a little chuggy and slowed down here and there but not very much it's it's almost like a political youth crew record it's awesome then uh then we've got Yuppicide from New York. This band was really unique. They were the headliner of the first show I ever attended. This is their second LP, Shinebox, which is my favorite. Uh, they have three LPs, and then they were gone for a while, and then they did a couple records a couple of years ago. Uh, I think they did an EP and an LP like in the mid-2000s, I want to say. Uh, this by far is my favorite. It's really weird. It's really dark. It does have like inc nice, fast, uh, ripping, circle pit inducing New York hardcore kind of stuff um, all throughout it. It's got a lot of odd college rock influence, 
seeping in. There's like some weird jangly guitars. There's a few moments on the album where Jesse the singer has that like weird broken mic, like almost like ministry thing here and there. There's some oddly poetic things going on. It's got a lot of stuff about broken relationships and and that sort of deal. Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting record. It's like 75% raging fast NYHC, but 25% weirdness. Um, great, great record. Then uh, you've got SFA. I actually grabbed two of their records because they're so good and so underrated that I feel like I should mention more than one. Uh, this is from 1990, so it's barely the 90s when this came out. And I think a lot of these songs were written in the 80s with their old vocalist, Mike Bullshit. Uh, but this band was New York City Hate Core, it says right there. Um, despite the fact that hate was like kind of the centerpiece of a lot of their lyrics, uh, their singer was a uh, was a member of the Socialist Workers Party, or at least at some point, because he gives them a shout out on this. Uh, but yeah, just negative, pissed, hardcore. You can imagine like the hardest of New York hardcore, like from that era, maybe Breakdown and Sheer Terror, but punked up a lot more, like equal parts that, and maybe equal parts like early Black Flag or something along those lines. Nice deep vocals. Super moshy, really good. Then they did a record in between that one and this one. This is Solace. The one in between was one of those like written in the studio, mostly written in the studio kind of albums, and it's it's called So What. It's it's okay, but this Solace record kills. Unfortunately, they were on We Bite America and had a lot of issues. That was a European label that uh, had a few. American bands on the roster and just didn't do a very good job promoting them from what I've gathered. Slapshot was on that label for a little while, but uh, this is great. This takes their sound that they've been kind of honing all throughout their existence up until this point from like the mid 80s on and really honing it into something heavy. It's got great production. It's super pissed. There's a song bragging about how he killed Kurt Cobain and <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Uh, there's a great song on and on, which is basically like an oi song. That's the great thing with a lot of East Coast hardcore, like true hardcore, or whatever, like pure hardcore. There's often like a nice oi influence kind of filtering through. Next up, we'll get into some seven inches here. This is the Denied. Classic two-tone photocopied cover. Got gas masks, helmets. Uh, you know, a lot of people would say that this is a crust record. I'd say, yeah, it's sort of, you know, it's got that sort of crusty hardcore thing to it. But it's far more straightforward. It's really not that metallic. It's fast. It's very punchy. It, it's awesome. It's an awesome hardcore record, in my opinion. Again, an example of one of those things where I'm like, eh, I feel like they're more of a really of a hardcore band than a lot of the quote unquote hardcore bands at the time. Um, but yeah, you know, we got like five songs on here, real punch in the face, angry, fast, hardcore stuff, a little grimy, a little crusty, but it's not like, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like Amoebix or anything along those lines or Hell Crusher or something like that. Then you got Fit for Abuse. This came out on Crust Records. Right smack dab in the middle of the 90s. I want to say, let's say it's uh, 1996. I saw, I think their demo was 95. Um, saw them with Devoid of Faith and Drop Dead in Albany, Schenectady specifically. Changed my life. <laughs> really, really good band. Uh, the vocalist for this band is the drummer for the Dropkick Murphys and has been for quite some time now. But I was blown away by this. I couldn't believe how fast they were playing. I had no idea that there were bands still like this at the time playing at this tempo. It's very much like negative effects, negative approach, raw vocals, hyper, hyper fast drumming. Tempo's approaching the first DRI 7-inch as well. Perfect hardcore record. It got reissued on 12-inch. Uh, by Armageddon Shop. If you come across that, I recommend you pick it up. It, it sounds awesome, super loud. Um, there's gonna be a lot of Boston on this because I lived in Boston uh, for years. Uh, when a few of these records were coming out, I lived there, and uh, Boston was a hotbed for this kind of traditional hardcore revival, especially in the late 90s. 
This is Cops and Robbers Face to Face with Hate. This came out in right in 99, I think. Uh, this is cool because it has that hyper-fast hardcore thing uh, that, that the early 80s bands had, especially Boston bands. Uh, but it has more kind of sung, almost kind of oi vocals here and there. Guy Micah was in Pinkerton Thugs, who were a big deal in the punk scene at the time. But this is, has an anthemic quality. along with the, the blasting and the same can be said for this poor excuse seven inch um this is a little bit more like aggro like skinhead hardcore kind of stuff um mike the vocalist definitely was inspired by roger murray from agnostic front but not to an obnoxious degree like rick to life was this also has a, a nice anthemic quality like on the song for all those in power it does almost reach like a crossover level at certain points just in regards to the the tempo shifts and stuff but it's still firmly a hardcore record really good then uh from further west western mass you had last in line again end of the decade 99 an awesome record a uh, little little less hyper fast but still very you know like a, a speedy swagger to it like the chromags are poison idea kind of fast but again those those sandpaper vocals inspired by john brannan of course and uh probably hodges who inspired john brannan but great ripping hardcore cool band too they were in, into a lot of horror movies and that kind of reflected with a lot of their album art and a handful of their songs. Then uh, going back to the beginning of the decade, I never really hear people talk about pressure release that much when they're talking about Youth Crew stuff or NYHC from that era, late 80s, early 90s. And it's just really well developed, fast, hardcore stuff. Um, personal lyrics, you know, personal struggles. Pretty typical for this music at the time, but only uh, only three songs, but it's it's really well done. Then Ocean of Mercy, who almost got disqualified for having too many influences outside of traditional hardcore, but I decided to keep it because it's got enough fast on it. But they're definitely leaning into where Burn was going and Turning Point were going with some melodicism, some like more in-depth, thought-out instrumentation, slower parts and that kind of thing. But plenty of fast going on there, too. They played with the upside at that first show that I went to. This is a great seven inch. Uh, just uh, three songs on this too, it's a short one. I believe they were called Step Down before this. Or Juvenocracy. One of their one of their old bands was on that uh, Voice of the Voiceless comp. Discipline, Discipline. Juvenocracy and Step Down. Step Down, Down was pretty slit lip. Then uh, Mouthpiece, self-titled seven inch. I mean, I think Mouthpiece's role in the legacy of hardcore is well cemented and, and well documented and respected, but I, I don't know if this this little record, this debut 7-inch gets enough love. It's just great youth crew hardcore. It's, it's almost kind of dark and angry. I think there was a lot of sentiment in the early 90s about how all these bands had quote-unquote sold out or moved on, and the bands that were still holding on to... Uh, the musical style, and I think people felt that way about the straight edge philosophy too, where it was a little less start today, positive, break down the walls, that kind of thing. It was more like, where have you gone? You know, like that kind of thing. Uh, can we win? You know. But uh, yeah, this is a great record. I never really got into the stuff past it, past this record that much. Um, Tim McMahon is a hard working man, one of the hardest working men in show business. Played in tons of bands after mouthpiece um did a really good blog for a long time interviewing bands and and that kind of thing uh documenting it he's definitely one of those people that's clearly clearly very passionate about the music he loves so real recognizes real there shout out um all right and then we got plagued with rage x plagued with rage x from buffalo um the youth crew revival that went on in the late 90s, I know a lot of people have a strong affection for it, strong nostalgia for it. Ironic because it was nostalgic to begin with. Those bands were, were good, I just never really never really took to them for one reason or another. It might have been the, the sporto element of it, the kind of jock core element of it. But there were a handful of bands from Buffalo from 
the earlier part of the decade from 92 to 95 ish that I really I really had a strong uh, liking towards Plagued with Rage was one of them just fast um, pissed like almost falling apart like drummers trying to play faster than the guitars kind of stuff the back picture kind of says it all right there they're all jumping um, and the guys that ran the label that put that out third party records put out his own band half mast this is their seven inch influence they had a bunch of stuff out they were around for a good part of the 90s um i don't know handful of records i can't remember how many this was the one that i listened to the most uh and it was just like nothing i'd heard growing up where i went to shows there was nothing chugging about it they played fast four four beats and stuff like that um yeah it's just a great fast hardcore record and then i don't know if anybody will have heard of this this is a band from downstate new york as i'd refer to it like i don't know the suburbs of new york city i think harem in new york a band called god awful um i looked these guys up a really long time ago and i need to check again because i forget what bands they were but they were in this band and had like a brother band called disclaimer and both the members went on to be in some more kind of like the last update so sort of screamo-ish post-hardcore kind of stuff hey it's a quick editor's bay thing here um it was just driving me crazy because i couldn't remember what bands those were i looked up that so long ago and discogs is actually kind of spotty about it <clears throat> um but apparently the bass player in god awful was none other than mike shaw who is the guy that plays guitar in mind Forest, who are a pretty big deal hey kitty yes i know it is a big deal indeed uh, who, you know, if you're into New York hardcore, Poughkeepsie's Mind Force are one of the bigger bands going right now. So if that's right, Discogs isn't always accurate, but, uh, cause it's a wiki, but bass player forgot awful guitarist in Mind Force. Heard it here first. Um, and it kind of makes sense. I hadn't listened to this in years and threw it on the turntable again to refresh myself for this video. And it's interesting. It sounds kind of like later Minor Threat when they started involve a little bit more influences and, and approaches than just playing all out fast all the time. But, and it, there's some interesting drumming going on. There is fast drumming on it, but there's an interest, a, a weird way the guy's going about hitting the toms and hitting the cymbals. It seems like oddly out of time and sort of jazzy. It, it makes sense that they would have gone on to like a post hardcore band but for the most part it is straightforward mostly fast like punk hardcore stuff which this came out in 94 95 i mean there was nothing coming through syracuse more than once in a blue moon that sounded anything remotely like this so this and the fit for abuse seven inch i, I lived off of in the mid 90s then you have i hate you from philly uh they were sort of a gag band their whole thing were was being militant straight edge but uh not in the same way as a lot of bands that were being political with it it was strictly a i don't like you because you're not straight edge i'm better than you <laughs> like that was pretty much the whole message of the band they wore ties and shirts when they played uh it was an interesting kind of vibe it was very much like fast almost power violence like we're getting close to getting close to blast beats there straightforward hardcore there and very short songs like under a minute so really pissed really snotty um i heard they got into some altercations for running their mouths at shows and stuff like that they're called i hate you you know finally from the seven inches we have h100s texas deathmatch so 
Tony Erba, well-respected name in American hardcore for good reason. He's national treasure. Uh, I think a lot of people talk about a few of his other bands, one of which I'll mention in a minute. Um, people talk about Face Value. People talk about Nine Shocks Terror. He's a no known guy, and I think H100s have a certain level of infamy, but it might have been kind of not, I don't want to say forgotten, but not talked about as much as uh, as it used to be. During the mid-90s, they were, they were maniacs, uh, doing a lot of wrestling-themed stuff, berating the crowd. There's a live recording that was put on an LP not that long ago where they're opening for Integrity and One Life Crew and just trying to engage the crowd in a physical altercation by berating them. Uh, the music is really fast, snotty, kind of hardcore that seems to be somewhat influenced by a lot of the kind of unhinged Japanese stuff. Japanese hardcore stuff, and uh, yeah, they're they're amazing. They're a great band. Um, Nine Shocks Terror were, of course, great too. A few more LPs. So might as well launch right into this. This is Face Value's Price of Maturity. This would be Erba's first band. He was the vocalist for this band. Um, I mean, this is such a cool mix of styles. I know I say that a lot, but this really, really is a cool mix of styles. What I mean is, yeah, it's it's fast, hardcore, um, you know, not too, too fast. We're talking kind of same drive as Uniform Choice or something like that, Youth of Today. Uh, but they lay it in the pocket, and everybody in this band can really, really play. The bass player plays with his fingers, I believe. There's lots of solos. And instead of having, like, a crossover metal influence in the way that anybody that springs to mind when you say that, DRI or whatever... Instead of having a thrash metal thing going on, it's almost like a a really dope like 70s hard rock metal kind of thing, like a Sabbathy thing that creeps in. And it doesn't sound like it would really gel that well, but it really, really does. It it rages. At one point they even like steal the beginning riff from uh, Children of the Sea and then just go into like a three chord rager of a song. Um it, it's a it's a great, great record. This is Price of Maturity, nineteen ninety conversion records. Great artwork by uh the Human Furnace from Ringworm, by the way. Love that artwork. Considered it for a back piece many times. Still am. <laughs> still don't have my back done yet. There's still time. Then you've got Endpoints in a Time of Hate. Um, I talked about a bunch of these several times over the years on my channel. Uh, all those videos are really old now, and I want to kind of talk about them in a fresh context. Specifically, the Four Walls Falling and, and Face Value in this record, because they were such... Um, there were such formative records for me getting into hardcore and everything. Endpoint was really important because every record that they did was vastly different from the last. So uh, this one is more or less their youth crew record, um, you know. But there's, again, this is a band from 1990 with their own stamp on the, that formula of uniform choice and youth of today and bold and stuff like that. Uh, Endpoint were from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and they were close buddies with a band called King Horse that were a hard rock metal band that came from the punk and hardcore scene that were like a meaner, faster Danzig, like the band Danzig is the best way to boil it down. They were a band that was equally inspired by Bad Brains as they were Black Oak, Arkansas. And they had a certain drawl. And it's funny because they were like the older brother band to Endpoint and used to sneak them into gigs, apparently, from what I've read on the internet. Um... And you can hear the influence of King Horse's vocal style on Endpoint, except Endpoint is a, you know, a, a straight edge, fast hardcore band. But it, it really adds something to it because the the singer has just a little bit of a croon, like a little bit of soul, a little bit of a croon behind the vocal style. And I think that makes a really, really big difference. But yeah, Rob Pennington, one of my favorite lyricists and vocalists, every record they did after this was very different. Um, by the time After Taste, which was their last LP, came along it was way more like post hardcore almost emo kind of stuff but that's a brilliant record too very very good i'm gonna go flip that record over all right and then uh 97a which was this is a new one to me i actually think pretty sure i bought this when i moved here a couple of years ago so i'd heard about 97a for years i know that they were um just ahead of the curve of like all this fast hardcore coming back in the very late 90s um 
into the early 2000s, there was the whole thrash, bandana thrash, fast hardcore revival that happened, started happening in about 99 or so, and that's when bands like DS-13 started coming around. Um, that Western Mass stuff was involved as sort of part of it. You had all, all the bands from the West Coast, like What Happens Next and Life's Halt and all that stuff. Um, and again, I'm not going to go too far into the weeds with the earliest stuff from that because I feel like it's pretty well talked about. 97A, you don't hear about that much. They were from Jersey, and they were just super fast. They were first DRI record fast, just or Deep Wound, you know, that kind of thing. They were a little bit more clean cut, like 97A is a, a reference to skateboard wheel durometer, you know, they had a kind of a skate theme to them and everything, but um, yeah, just fast, unrelenting, hardcore punk from Jersey. I've heard this referred to as an EP, because I guess it's like the length of one, but look how many songs are on that. Um, Abandoned Future EP. Yeah, it says right there. I, I don't know. It is uh, it is it is really, really good, though. Um, yeah, the whole bandana thrash thing was, was a cool, interesting time. I was lucky enough to be around and see a lot of those bands, but I'm not going to get too into the weeds with that stuff, because, like I said, this is for things that I feel are low rated. And then finally, uh, just a couple of CDs. I don't have too many CDs. It's hardcore, it's, it's such a vinyl friendly kind of deal, you know? Um, I actually should have pulled out the 7 inch for Failure Face because the All Pain No Gain 7 inch by Failure Face is a classic 90s hardcore record. But I do have the discography right there, everything they recorded. Uh, Mid 90s Florida stuff that was very fast, very thought-provoking, just didn't sound like anything else. Um, along with, and I should have grabbed that too, but I didn't, along with CR, Compassionate Revolution from Long Island, you could see how it would appeal to people that were into the chaotic stuff like heroin, and also to people in the straight, forward, fast, hardcore, like Infest um, or Voorhees. It was kind of floating somewhere in the middle and not really exactly like either. Um, taking a lot of inspiration from 80s stuff as well. A lot of really great, honest songs about a bunch of serious topics, mental health issues and stuff like that. And then we have The Neighbors. The more money one has, the more important is one's life. Really good band, and I never really hear that much about them. This, I think, was on Kangaroo Records that put out some, some Massachusetts hardcore stuff as well. I believe they put out Out Cold, too, not mistaken. But yeah, like, gravel-throated, again, John brandon -y kind of vocals. A little bit of double bass, if I'm remembering right, it's been on this. I haven't listened to it in a long time, but I remember being really impressed by, like, the guy's singing voice and how commanding it was, and also um, really tight drumming. But yeah, 1999, uh, didn't really hear about that band that much, and they were good. And then now Cold. I mean, I think they get more and more accolades all the time, because people you know, didn't appreciate them enough when they were around for what an incredible band they were. But I think as years go by, more and more people are going to realize just how awesome they were and how flawless their output was. This is their first full-length, self-titled, from the mid-90s at some point. Um, dedicated to the memory of Gigi Allen. Yeah, because uh, Mark Sheehan from this... 1993. Uh, Mark Sheehan from this band did a record with Gigi, The Suicide Sessions. Um, they got a lot more like really fast and really, really tight later. This is a little bit more like rocking out, like maybe leaning more towards the slightly more rock and poison idea stuff in terms of sound, but it's uh, for sure a killer hardcore punk record. Rejuvenate, this is a band I always liked and I never, I hear them discussed maybe once in a while during the whole kind of New York hardcore conversation that goes on. Tommy Ratt, the vocalist, was the original vocalist for Warzone. And it's it's just fast, mean. I mean, there's a metal edge to it, but it's not really metalcore or anything like that. It's metal guitar tone, I guess. Fast, mean, hardcore from New York. Gruff kind of vocals, too. More of those kind of spat, sort of almost neglect or sheer terror kind of mean guy sort of sort of singing style um but yeah this song called dis by you you know it's a new york band it's got to be a song called dis by you right um but yeah fast uh anthemic too like really good mean kind of choruses fist in the air kind of swigging a beer kind of choruses and yeah i think that's it i think there's one i forgot oh yeah one more okay another great example of like 
yeah, they look like they look like the casualties or something, like total punkers, you know? Leather jackets and the, the bondage pants even. But you want to talk about hard and scary, the undesirables, uh, destruction chaos. Just, oh, it's like, it's kind of almost like uh, Oi on like double speed. Really fast, like spat, ranting vocals, like songs about really, really disliking police a lot. Um, <laughs> stuff like that. Just... Furious, furious record. It's uh, not not an easy one to track down. I don't think these days. Either that, or it's like a dollar on Discogs, and nobody nobody cares. But I think it's I think it's awesome. Destruction Chaos. Don't don't, don't expect, expect street punk. It's uh, or it's street punk in the truest sense, anyway. Just violent, mean, hardcore punk. All right, that's it. Um, that's it for hardcore for a while. I have stacks and stacks of metal. I'm going to be discussing next. I've got a pile of newer death metal and a pile of classic death metal that I've dug up from the catacombs of reality. So I hope you're excited about that. I know I am. Until uh, next time, have a good night, day, evening, morning, afternoon, whatever you're having, have it well. Talk to you later. GZS out. <laughs>